Hello, welcome to this Exchange Chambers podcast with myself, John Tribe, and with Mark Coulson QC and Carly Sandbach. We're going to talk about the new act. So here it is. This is the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. This is a, a hard copy of the act. We're going to talk a, a, around six points in this podcast. Uh, about the Act and how it came to pass and how it sits in policy terms um, as well. So by way of introduction, do you want to just give um, a, a brief overview of your feelings about the new Act, Mark and Charlie, in turn? Yeah, um, well, I, I think it's helpful to just look how, at how the, how the bill developed, why, why, we, why we are where we are. Um, as I see it, it's a, a development of the rescue culture that began essentially with the Insolvency Act uh, 1986, uh, but brought into focus by the present coronavirus crisis uh, and the fact that urgent legislation has needed to be brought into play, but that has provided the opportunity to bring forward um, some provisions that were being talked about, have been the subject matter of government consultation and so on, and were going to be brought onto the statute book at some time, uh, but have been brought forward much uh, much sooner than anticipated. It's been a bit of a rush, and uh, likely to be one or two gaps in there and some drafting in, drafting problems that are going to come out in, in due course, but it, it's been a, a prompt response to a situation we're in at the moment. Um, we can talk a bit more fully in a few moments about perhaps a bit more about the genesis of it, but perhaps Carly might have a few comments on, by way of general observation. On, on yeah, no, no only, only to agree really. I mean, w we will of course, as practitioners and, and academics, um, descend into kind of very detailed analysis of the act and how it works, or we'll analyze how it comes to be interpreted by the courts. But um, w one has to be uh, a little impressed in fact, by um, the ability of, um, of the relevant department to draft this legislation in such a short time and, and get it enacted into to law. Plainly, there will be critiques to be, to, to be leveled at the various parts of it, but um, I think that it was the right thing to do to take the opportunity to enact both the substantive things that have been in the pipeline for some time and also to deploy some of the more urgent measures that we are already seeing are having a day-to-day -day effect. Um, certainly, I mean, the most obvious example being the kind of prohibitions around winding up petitions which are making a real difference on the ground to businesses and therefore the individuals that deal with them so um obviously it's been a huge feat to, to get it off and running and, and we're all familiarizing ourselves and, and dealing with it now but um but yeah it's big yeah. change in the insolvency world and we, we we can come back in a few moments and talk a bit more about moratoriums and uh, and the other provisions but yeah, just to think about the context of it and the development of the rescue culture. Mm. Um, one goes back to when I started off in practice, um, appearing on winding up petitions. If you're acting for the debtor company, if you hadn't paid the debt, you were going to be wound up and there just was no way out of that, really. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I saw the, the 1986 Act um, come into force and, and the, the provisions there. Um, and that, of course, was the implementation of many of the recommendations of the, the Cork Report, which had been published in its final form, I think, in 1982. And then there was the government white paper in 1984, which mm. uh, brought forward many of those provisions. And that was the start of the regime with uh, administration, um, at, at, at company voluntary arrangements, individual voluntary arrangements, and introducing the concept of the administrative receiver for, for, mm. for receiverships. Can we go back to that time or, or mull a bit on that time? So I was just thinking, as you were speaking, about you know, the, the options that were available. So you know, liquidations uh, or maybe schemes of arrangement, that kind of yeah. you know, limited uh, set of options. So when you were you know, first in chambers and, and you know, your pupil masters were talking to you about the insolvency landscape and all that sort of thing, how prevalent uh, in your thinking and their thinking was using receivership so pre-86 receivership as a rescue tool and i, I have in mind will star rolls royce you know these are sort yeah. of 1970s examples of trading receiverships yeah that was that was that a thing back then oh, well it well it certainly was but of course it depended on the debenture holder support didn't it okay. and the, the the bank the bank the bank being yeah. buying into what was being proposed but certainly yeah. yes that would be your first port of call would be to go to the bank and uh 
possibly through a receivership um, uh, achieve a rescue. But, but more generally, it was the bank appointing, uh, appointing receivers in order to realise the assets for its own benefit. And yeah. That was part of the purpose of the new administrative receiver, of course, who mm. owed duties not just to the appointing venture holder, but to creditors in general. Yeah. Um, so, so in the background, since there was a kind of vibe of rescue, it wasn't just about like what, what, what was your impression? I think it was a it was a very limited vibe. Of oh, okay. I, yeah. I think there I think there was perhaps one or two companies where one had bank support for some sort yeah. of rescue package, but um, I, I think apart from that, no, there, yeah. there wasn't that culture. But of course, there was bubbling away in the background. Yeah. Uh, the, the court report sitting there and talk about implementing it and and. The comparisons being drawn with the US Chapter 11 and uh, yeah. the, the, de the debtor in possession options and that, that debate that debate was all going on yeah. um, at, at that time. So, so when 86, you know, when it happened, when like, you know, the nuclear button was hit and we had, as you, as you said, CVAs, Company Voluntary Agents, Administration, Administrative Receivership, etc. Was there a real kind of mind shift in, in how you as a practitioner in oh, your... Well, yeah, absolutely. Yes, because the administration was seen as the rescue tool, um, the, the way in which a, a company could be rescued. That that certainly the, the, what we we thought was going to happen, so far as administration is concerned. And we, we go on and talk about it in in, in due course. Yeah. But I I think that the, the regime didn't achieve uh, what was intended in the mm. sense that very very few cases did, did we actually see subsequent to that uh, a rescue of a company through administration so, so on that point i was wondering if carly might reflect on so if that's mark's mark's sort of early ideas around 86 taking us through up to you know the problems with a lack of administration up to 2002 i wonder if carly yeah. wanted to reflect on like the story from 2002 onwards in the rescue terms yeah absolutely so i mean if we just reflect on what, what most of us do when we first start out on our feet, which is being the winding up course, as Mark's already referred to, um, his experience will have been, if you weren't going to pay the debt, you're wound up. Um, by the time I was on my feet in 2006, we'd already moved a little bit away from that in that you would quite often see um, repeated adjournments for alternative um, insolvency regimes to be proposed. So whether that was for an administration to be considered, whether it was for a CBA proposal to be put for creditors. Um, and you, I suppose you, you've seen the, the start of a trend um, uh, in favor of rescue, if I can generally, um, perhaps not in the terms that we're going to be talking about it now, as we read it in the context of the new act, but, but a trend towards um, certainly seeking to achieve rescue aims um, and really seeing a compulsory winding up as a last resort um, mm. regime um, for the company, uh, because mm. we all know that it, that, that it is the end of the company, essentially. Mm. So, um, so we'd already started to see that, um, and of course, the Enterprise Act, Act reforms um, had come in and I think everybody really was still very hopeful about administrations and what they could achieve in terms of rescue. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in slightly more detail, but I think that um, the legislation that's now been put forward really um, is, a, is, a, is a recognition of the fact that, that, that it didn't do all that it was hoped would be uh, achieved mm. via those um, administration reforms. Yeah. Uh, certainly, if one looks at the kind of the, the three alternative statutory purposes mm. of an administration, <coughs> um, uh, very often uh, it, it would be a very rare case indeed um, that the statutory purpose being achieved was the rescue mm. of the company as a going concern, which of course is the first um, yeah. as listed. Um, and so Arguably, if you just look at that from a statistical point of view, uh, that might be seen as a failure of that in terms of the, the, the regime and what it had hoped to achieve. Yeah, I think what, on that point, Prof, uh, Professor McCormack, at least, Jerry McCormack has um, called those three aims uh, a transmutation of, of well, administration, pre-2002 administration and administrative receivership in the the mm. final of the three aims basically is administrative receivership and mm. therefore um as you've suggested placates a certain um group of lobbyists um which, which for me is an interesting point when we think about the new act as we'll move into it in a moment and particularly yeah. as kind of 
I, I wonder what both your thoughts are on the kind of background themes of movement between, you know, if we could say that the 2002 Act, Enterprise Act changes, you know, changed from the rescue reinvigoration point that the policymakers were trying to get through as it passed through the Lords, the, you know, the, the, the creditor um, uh, lobby was able to perhaps, you know, ensure that administrative receivership was still extant. But how, I, I, you know, have we changed yeah. now as we've moved towards this new big bill? Are we seeing more rescue? Yeah. I, I think we have, but just, just to sort of analyse that a, a bit more, I, I think what's, what, what, what had happened with administration is administration had become a sort of de facto winding up. It had become the alternative to winding up um, and operated as an alternative to winding up, supposedly to achieve a better realisation of assets than, than <coughs> otherwise have been achieved. Um, and so you had administration and Ministry of Receivership running in tandem up to the 2002 Enterprise Act and then the Ministry of Receiverships disappeared and you've, you've just got administrations. And uh, things would probably go one of two ways. You, you, you might try a company voluntary arrangement and that might or might not work as a way out of administration. So that, 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 could, that could achieve the purpose of administration, I suppose. And, could save the company. But the problem there was that if you had dissenting creditors, they couldn't be crammed down. And this is something which the new act is, is, is going to try and help with. Mm. Um, the, the other thing is that the, the, the other way, what the focus was became was not so much rescue of the company, but rescue of the business. And rescue of the business often through a pre prac sale of the business. Mm. So what, what, what's, what's done is company goes into administration, administrators achieve a sale of the business very rapidly, possibly to form a management, which raises sort of issues in itself mm. or somewhere else. And then the sort of restructuring would be done in the new entity, particularly mm. if it's purchased by management, the restructuring through the new entity. And you haven't saved the company and the creditors of the, of the first company have, have potentially lost out. Yeah. And so it's sort of addressing some of those themes, I think, that we yeah. sort of run into the, the new legislation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, think that, I think that 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 concern that that is what was happening is that that's all too often um, the business or the, 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 the valuable parts of the business would be pre-packed out and the rest of the company and its mm -hmm. operation jettisoned. Um, and therefore not really a rescue in the in the truest sense is perhaps yeah. what's led us to uh, the reforms that we see now um, which are aimed at a a proper rescue if I can put it in those terms of the company um, mm. and prevents by the cram down procedure mm. um, well, creditors preventing that happening on, on that point the I attended a virtual R3 RPB meeting where Paul Bennis, the head of policy for the insolvency service, briefly explained the the aims and objectives of what this, what is now the SIG bill 2000, uh, 2020. Um, and one of the questions that came in from the RPBs afterwards was on this point, on the term of our business or company. Um, and I was expecting when the, the person asked him to explain why they'd chosen uh, within the moratorium part, and part 26A company, as opposed to business, him to go down this route as you've you've just gone down, Carly, of um, you know, broader stakeholders, pluralism, you know, Section One Seven Two, the Companies Act type ideas of you know, broader stakeholders, rescuing the company, not hived off elements. Yeah. But he didn't. He he basically well just sort of mulled on it a bit, but not in those terms. Just as a sort of general term of art, not with some underlying you know, background history of of why we might rescue the company it was interesting so i'm I, i'm not uh, be interested to see as he molds on it more what you know, how they do focus on company stroke business as it operates within the policy um because i'm not sure he necessarily had th these points in mind um mm. but but that could just be my um interpretation i suppose do, do, do you, should we progress through our six yeah. areas that so that's so, that that the um the, the uh, as, as we've we've seen it, it, it is a piece of legislation that rocketed through the both houses of the legislature in in record time for you know, important reasons um so on the passage of the SIG bill i thought we could spend some time perhaps first thinking about you know sort of house of commons stage and then the house of lords stage have either of you got any reflections on either of those two stages or the sort of temporary permanent measures that we've seen? 
Um, only really to say that um, th that has to be, in, in any analysis of the bill, we've got to take account of the kind of twin aims that it was seeking to achieve. The one is the kind of more urgent, uh, temporary um, measures that were required to kind of stem the economic fallout from the COVID-19 crisis. And the other is the more long-lasting um, reforms um, with the introduction of a more all-encompassing rescue culture to the UK insolvency landscape. Um, now, obviously, in the circumstances, it was appropriate that all those be encompassed into, you know, what, what ultimately is a really quite wide-ranging um, bill covering corporate insolvency and company governance more generally. You know, it, in itself, it, it, it involves introductions into the Companies Act as well as having its own standalone provisions. I, I mean, we we have to be careful, I think, when analysing this, that we always um, analyse it in the context of the real world real world situation, which required um, an urgent response to it, to an urgent situation. Um, and I think that um, the the fact that there may need to be refinements is acknowledged by the inclusion of some of those um, perhaps slightly controversial Henry VIII's powers um, for ongoing amendment effectively of the legislation. Um, although yeah. admittedly those in the final act were, were watered down slightly. Um, but it, but it, was, it was always going to need to go through very quickly. Um, obviously more scrutiny uh, was had as you might expect in the Lords. Um, um, uh, and obviously the, the, there's not been the same opportunity that one would usually have to analyze a bill like this but um but but overall i think that it's been pretty well received yeah. i mean yeah. i don't yeah. think the criticism uh, the I think the, though, though, although it was sort of it was rushed through the quality of debate in the house of lords i thought I thought was extremely extremely high and some some very distinguished speakers in, in the debate you know you had lord hope and craig had for example former supreme court justice uh, and Lord Thomas, former Lord Chief Justice, um, speak, speaking in the debate and, and, and making valuable points. Mm. And um, you know, some useful amendments were made. They, the, so far as the super priority debts on, in the moratorium, there were issues in relation to the ability of banks to recover advance payments um, as, as part of the super priority. That was something that was dealt with by way of an amendment. So the, the government did listen and take on board some sort of sense of amendments during that progress. Yeah. So, as I mentioned before, I think there, there, there are bound to be some holes in the legislation and some problems are going to emerge because it was rushed through. But having said that, there, there was a, a good quality of debate and an interesting debate on the role of prepacks as well, um, which caused the government to accept an amendment which restored provisions that had been in Schedule B1 of the Insolvency Act, giving the Secretary of State mm. power to regulate uh, pre-PACs, so that that was, had, had lapsed, but is now, yeah. now back there. Um, yeah. I, I was struck by if, if my point earlier about the Enterprise Act 2002 being kind of creditor-friendly in its result, I was struck by how, particularly in the House of Lords, but I, I think it's fair to say that in the Commons, they were you know, briefed by various stakeholders as well. But you know, we had direct reference to some of the professional bodies, mm. uh, um, uh, particularly, for example, R three, where they, there was a they, they highlighted the sort of silo nature of these you know, good rescue um, focused provisions in the SIG Act. But then, of course, later in the year with the Finance Act, um, twenty twenty, as it will be, I suppose. The, the the issues around preferential status and HMRC and how you know, these sort of inconsistencies that, as you say, were you know, brought out by a number of peers. Um, so for me, uh, what, what I think was interesting was the kind of sorry, the switch in the lobbying activity that seemed to me to move us away from basically a, a sort of creditor-friendly environment to a more rescue focused environment i didn't see any debate it particularly in the lords that was was as strong as we saw in the enterprise act uh, passage i thought um i think that's really a return to this point i was making that context is everything for this legislation and those debates are taking place in the middle of the pandemic mm. where 
for the average person watching the activities of, of Parliament and, and the government, um, there is real financial concern for their own for their own position. Um, and rightly or wrongly, the uh, the view is taken that the rescue of the largest businesses, the largest entities, um, you know, is is a major priority in any kind of economic crisis. And so I think that that's perhaps why we saw. Um, perhaps less focus on those those items that you've uh, identified. And what what what's what's your view on that kind of silo point about the finance act preferentials and uh, HMRC as a preferential? If that will stymie rescue, do you, do you foresee a a problem ahead or not? Oh, well, I, I I ought to I ought to reveal kind of full disclosure because I do sit on the um um the the GTC committee of R three, so um, I, I'm mm. privy to kind of those those debates there uh, clearly. Yeah. Clearly, um, the discussions around uh, crown preference are, are very well documented, um, and obviously there will be tension between the the rescue com the rescue culture that is uh, that is put forward and advocated by this act, and uh, the potential dampening down effect of uh, the return of crown preference. Yeah, um, yeah. As yeah, it is very much a retrograde step because you know the lead up to the Enterprise Act twenty o two. Um, it, it, was, it was it was very much part of the package that, that preferential creditors would lose their, their rights. That was all part of the, the theme of the rescue culture that was being promoted at, at, at that stage. Uh, so it, it is very much a retrograde step. And I think was, certainly the experts do seem to think it, it could well make a difference. It is, it, what I find strange about it is the idea that and in sort of government budget terms, particularly, you know, the sort of expenditure we've seen recently, but even in normal times when... Uh, depending on who you read but basically I, I think the clawback that they got was between 80 and 140 million you know, mm. it, it, like, you know in government terms you know just a uh, drop in the ocean so yeah. to stymie an entire method of 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 you know entrepreneur support seems to me a bit strange but um that i suppose they've got their counter arguments around you know it's it's specific tax for specific purposes you know. yeah and i suppose the argument is that if you if you're sort of keeping a company going on a lifeline and it is collecting vat mm. then it was never the company's money and uh, yeah. that, should, that should be accounted for in due course and yeah. it shouldn't it shouldn't be sort of money that funds funds the funds yeah. trading which is then totally lost yeah so that's part, part of the thinking so that, that's our, our sort of general thoughts on policy and um sorry on passage of the bill um, so just before we move on to some more su substantive points about the law itself, just in policy terms, where would you place the, the SIG Act 2020 in our, our broad sweep of acts on insolvency statutes? I think it's a major step in promoting the or seeking to promote the rescue culture because of its introduction of the concept of, of, of debtor in possession, which is a a, a new, very much a new thing. I mean, we're going to go on and perhaps look in a few moments at the, the aspects of that, but um, you know, that, that's a sort of very major thing. So it is very much the next step and it is yeah. seeking to redress the problem that we highlighted before in relation to administrations, that they, they weren't achieving the, the survival of the company. It does mm. provide a potential way of, of uh, allowing the company to survive in circumstances where it, it wouldn't otherwise. Mm. I think exactly that. I think that the the new feature, which is the the cross class cram down uh, procedure, is is the game changer for this mm -hmm. as a regime, um, and, and therefore introduces a um, it, to that extent that it, it does change the law quite significantly in terms of rescue and, and UK insolvency law. Um, and this is perhaps something we might come on to, but that's going to be um, I, I think putting that in its international context is quite important as well. So looking at the comparisons between chapter 11 uh, and also the regimes that are going to be available um, across EU countries, particularly after obviously uh, Brexit and, and, and the UK having an alternative forum and jurisdiction for companies seeking that kind of rescue. Because of course, um, the te relevant test is that there is a sufficient connection with this jurisdiction so it doesn't actually have to be um, a UK company to take advantage of some of those provisions so again putting it putting the act both in its um, its context both social context economic context and international context I think is important to any analysis yeah 
uh, it, for, for me, the kind of, I, I wish I had a kind of insolvency Ouija board where I could commune with the, the Cork uh, committee and say, or get their reflections on, you know, I think this might be your rescue vision coming to pass at last. You know, it's, um, it's here. You know, it was stymied in 86, almost 2002, as we've discussed, and, you know, now maybe we have these tools. And that, then the other thing I, I think for me that I've been reflecting on for a while, um, as has Vanessa Finch um, um, uh, in, in her writing about the, the position of procedures along a timeline and where this sort of moves us back to that ex ante approach, that, that much earlier deployment of insolvency or other mechanisms to deal with these kind of liquidity issues. Yeah. Um, which, which, and as you say, you know, apes the kind of debtor in possession yeah. activity. Um, yeah. so I, I, just, if we just come back on, on part of it, I mean, part, part of it is, is obviously promoting the, the rescue culture. But at, at, at the end of the day, it's a question of striking a balance, I think, between the rights of creditors on the one hand and the, the company or the individual debtor on, on, on the other hand. Um, and, and where one gets that balance. Now, with, with the 1986 Act, the, the, there was a sort of clear focus, I think, on that balance because there were new reforms introduced that assisted the company or the debtor. Mm. But on the other hand, the regime was very strictly tightened. That mm. mean that uh, prior to the 1986 Act, uh, insolvency practitioners were not regulated in any way at all. Mm. Um, and you had practices such as centre-binding center and... Um, the sort of concept of the Phoenix Company and so forth. And um, the, the other side of the 1986 legislation was to tighten that, to introduce a regime for regulating insolvency practitioners, a regime of disqualification for company directors, new concepts like wrongful trading, uh, redefining preferences, transaction under value, all, all that sort of thing as a sort of counterbalance to that. Now, We've got a new set of legislation, which is, um, I think, assisting generally the debt of the company. Um, but I think one has to sort of try and keep in focus the protection of creditors on the other hand and mm. query whether in some aspects that, that, that has been rather lost. Yeah. Bearing in mind that creditors are not always sort of big, rich companies, but can mm. often be the small trader mm. who, who can provide goods in, in circumstances where if they're not paid, they mm. find great difficulties themselves. Yeah, I think we could we could also perhaps we could revisit that point with um, the moratorium in due course and yeah. keeping people out of their money, and then also perhaps your uh, and I agree with your director's point about that sort of balanced, um, uh, you know, watchful eye on the conduct of directors when we think about the wrongful trading um, relaxation, um, and it, and then I suppose we could also reflect a bit about well, did or have or generally do directors' duties generally work. Um, to forestall the kind of behaviour that, that, that you know, can damage creditors, as you suggest. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, I think one of the other consequences is this, and um, certainly, or themes, I ought to say, of, of, the, of the move uh, of travel is to encourage an, an earlier appraisal of the situation by directors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the, for instance, the, uh, the, the new restructuring plans um, you know, insolvency isn't a condition of, uh, 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 of proposing one of those plans. The financial condition is is is, is a different test, which is you know, um, the company must have encountered or be likely to encounter financial difficulties that may affect its ability to carry on business as a going concern. So, mm -hmm. a really quite broad definition, which would enable a company some time ahead of formal insolvency um, to propose um, propose a rescue scheme. So, I think that the um, it's perhaps more progressive in that sense, in that, that we are looking at pre preventative options rather than um, rescuing once the company's already gone over that that tipping point and that line into a formal insolvency. Yeah, we, we can call the um, you know, watchful eye on director's point, the calm Freund point, where he uh, once referred to the decision in Salomon and Salomon as calamitous because of the way in which directors could use the limited liability form to wreak havoc on creditors mm. and their, <laughs> their, you know, their just um, entitlement. So yeah, that can Freud, that was in the 1950s. So we, we you know, plus a chance things still occurring. Um,